We're so honored to have with us today a pillar of the Los Angeles legal industry, a Latina, an appellate attorney, a businesswoman. Through people underestimating you, telling you you can't do, they don't know you. They don't know your makeup. Perseverance and tenacity trumps intelligence any day of the week. If you continue on your path, regardless of what they tell you, you can succeed, you can achieve. The doors might be closed, you can push them open. If there's a little crack, push it through, push it through. You don't know how to get there, start figuring it out. Make the connection, start networking with other people. There are a lot of good people that will help you. Get comfortable being out of your comfort zone. Be comfortable being the only one who looks like you in the room. Show them that you can be the best you can be. All right, today is an absolute treat. We're so honored to have with us today a pillar of the Los Angeles legal industry, a Latina, an appellate attorney, a businesswoman, whose groundbreaking work as a lawyer and advocate have had an indelible impact in our society and would be more than enough to make someone call it a day, but whose career is surpassed only by her passion and love for empowering the next generation. She is a member has been president and is a founder of some of the most prestigious bar associations in Los Angeles, including the Latina Lawyers Bar Association, Mexican American Bar Association, the State Bar Board of Governors, State Bar Foundation, and is considered a friend and mentor by countless students, attorneys, and professionals. On today's episode of The Art of Purpose, Maria will share with us her journey toward finding her purpose. We'll hear about Maria's journey as an immigrant uh, and trailblazer in every area in which she has ever stepped foot, from early education, through college and law school, through her career as an attorney and as a person of influence throughout Los Angeles and all of Southern California. She is a woman who serves and empowers others. Hello, Maria, and welcome to The Art of Purpose. Hi, Kenny. Happy to be here. Thank you for inviting. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for making the long <laughs> trek out here to San Bernardino. <laughs> we know we're a ways from people. So thank you so much for doing that on and on a Saturday morning. It's fast pass helps. <laughs> yeah, there it does. <laughs> um, so you know what? I kind of wanted us to get started on a light sort of note today. Okay. Um, I asked you to bring something that uh, maybe a little trinket object that made uh, that had some significance for you. You brought two, uh, <laughs> and we have them here with us today. Um, here, I'll grab it real quick. We have. Let's see. We have a ticket from Disneyland, and can you tell us a little bit about this? Disneyland used to have um, tickets that you would buy, a book of tickets, mm -hmm. and in the book were uh, tickets to specific rides. And the each ticket was the most uh, popular because that was the Splash Mountain, uh, the submarine ride, which That's were awesome. the, the big attractions of the day. And this was, um, which camera? Yeah. Late, um, late 60s, early 70s is what I think this wow. ticket came from. And... Some of them were for, um, yeah, they were adult tickets and the junior, mm -hmm. um, I forget what the age group was, I think under 12. And um, you could catch a ride on one of the trolleys, probably with this ticket. Yeah. <laughs> but um, my sister found this in um, my mom's uh, memorabilia wow. uh, in one of her drawers. And I, I, you know, we were surprised yeah. that there was still one left. So... Um, it's in such great condition, it. too. It, it is. <laughs> well, my mom took care of her things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, that's so that's that's beautiful. So late sixties, early seventies. Um, you 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 mentioned something when you uh, first brought it out when you came, and you said that um, you know you're surprised that your parents could afford something like that, right? To yes. like because you had a big family. Right? Yes. So I'm the eldest of seven, uh, but growing up there were five of us primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, number. Um, see, number six came around when I was in middle school, and the last one, the year I started law school. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, same parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a big family. It's a, it's a Mexican American family, right? <laughs> yes, a very traditional Mexican American Catholic there we family. Go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's beautiful. My family, uh, my sisters in particular, love. Disneyland. Sharon <laughs> loves Disneyland. Chelsea loves Disneyland. And my parents got us uh, some annual passes when we were younger. And again, same sort of thing. It's like, wow, like I, that, that was something that they really wanted to provide for us and, you know, worked hard to save up and do that. And that meant a lot uh, for us. So. Yeah, we didn't have the passes, which would have helped, especially the SoCal ones that yeah. they had later when, when our son was small, mm -hmm. we took him yeah. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Speaking of Disney, then, um, you also brought something else here. We have it there. So I think everybody, if you want to grab it, you can. Um, there you go. Um, it is, uh, why don't you tell us what it is? So this is a Funko bobblehead of um, the Mandalorian. Mando and uh, Baby Yoda, also known as Grogu. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you said that you love uh, the Mandalorian, as do I, and everybody can tell because I have this big old <laughs> helmet here. I have other pop uh, sort of figurines on my desk. Um, why do you love, or what do you love about the Mandalorian so much? You know, I think it was, um, oh, I love Star Wars. So it, just that, that whole world and the, the theme of trying to do the right thing mm -hmm. against all odds, you know, no yeah. matter how, how much... Uh, someone might be oppressed or feeling oppressed, mm. they still were able to persevere to find some light, some happiness in it, in that, in that world. And when the Mandalorian came around, it was, I was intrigued because, mm -hmm. you know, the, <laughs> the Mandalorians were the bad guys, the bounty hunters. And right, they right. Were That's how we all knew them yeah, through Star Wars. Star Wars. Lore, right? So yeah. to have someone um, that was in that world, but then you find out, wait, we were prejudging mm. based on someone wow. else's viewpoint, yeah. and it's it's a, it's a culture, it's wow. a, 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 with a, a lot of history, mm -hmm. and wanting to do the right thing as well, mm -hmm. and and that really appealed to me, wanting to do the right thing, and especially for Mando the Mandalorian to to show his heart mm -hmm. and not be afraid to do the right thing, even against uh, judgment by his own people. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. And when you break it down like that, you're right, there is so much meaning uh, really to something that is otherwise just an entertainment yes. sort of thing, right? Right. So, I mean, I can get swept away by a world, but mm -hmm. but I do try to find whatever meaning is yeah. in, in, in what I watch no, I for love, entertainment. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And how do you, I mean, as I hear you talk this out, I think that has a lot of lessons for the way that we interact sort of in our society yes. with others as well, right? Yes. Um, as an attorney and the work that you do as well, um, um, do you see that overlap? I imagine that's why you're looking sometimes for overlaps. Maybe, and, you know, yeah. um, I've always had a strong sense of justice mm -hmm. um, and uh, get it primarily from my mom, I think. Yeah. My dad too, but mostly from my mom. <laughs> um, and I, I do look at that, you know, Growing up, sometimes you see the world in black and white, mm -hmm. but really there are a lot of grays. And somebody that has found themselves in the criminal justice system, if you look back at their history on the cases that we handle, especially the capital cases, the death penalty cases, mm -hmm. some of these you know, men primarily uh, never had a chance. They started out day one in the world um, you know, with uh, so many issues, uh, one client in particular, he, um, his mother was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. His father was a pimp. Pushed the mom in front of a car. Oh goodness! They, she's in, you know, the hospital. They're trying to keep her alive, full body cast, pumping all these drugs into her to, yeah. to help with the pain. And then they find out she's pregnant, uh, and with the person who would eventually be our client. And and that was just the start of his struggles and challenges. It, yeah, it broke my heart as a three-year-old. He burned his hand trying to cook lettuce because his mother wasn't uh, providing because she yeah. was on drugs. And and there were family, extended family, trying to get him, but she'd always go back. And yeah. to the day that of his sentencing, she would not admit that that she had some part in um, in the way he he ended up um, yeah. and not being a good mother in the early years. Uh, it's like no, no. It was him. He just didn't yeah. choose right and would not plead for his life, whereas most parents would, yeah. you know, put him away for life. I'm not sure. saying put him on the street, but don't, you yeah, know, save his that. life. But she would not do that. So, yeah. so just seeing those those stories, um, you know, real life stories, are uh, make an impact on how we judge people in in our everyday life and mm -hmm. not knowing where they came from, what they had to handle that, you know. Kind of feeling like they're for the grace of God go I. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I think is how yeah. I live my life, mm -hmm. and, and and trying to give people the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. and and um, not trying not to prejudge. Yeah, you. Um, I want to get into uh, sort of the early part of your life, mm -hmm. and you mentioned, however, a little bit about the work that you do um, to give uh, our uh, 
viewers, listeners, some context. Can you tell us, um, you're an appellate attorney, um, and can you tell us what that is for people who, and students who don't know, right? Young people yeah, who yeah. are maybe interested or don't even know that that's something that you can do as an attorney, law, right? right? Yeah. I, you know, it's not something I thought I would ever do, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it ended up uh, happening this way. So um, we um, practice primarily um, criminal cases, appeals, court appointed by the... Um, the Superior Court, by the Court of Appeals, and by the California Supreme Court mm -hmm. and the Ninth Circuit. So we handle um, when a defendant goes to trial and they lose that trial, mm -hmm. they have a right to appeal, mm -hmm. a constitutional right. Um, if an, if they can't afford an attorney, one will be provided because of the Gideon case, mm -hmm. if you remember from law school. Okay. And so we are those attorneys that get appointed. Um, and we're at a high enough level now that we get the, we can practice in the appellate and the sure. uh, death penalty case area, which is a little more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the transcripts, um, as you can imagine, are, you know, boxes and boxes full and then exhibits and files. Whatever. So we, what we do is we look at the trial, what happened in the trial. We can only look at the trial. Um, anything outside of the trial becomes part of habeas and another appellate process mm -hmm. uh, after the regular appeal is heard. So we... And if um, I could for a moment oh, there, Maria, okay. so it's a create further context here for everybody. Everything that you see uh, on TV, where oh. like they're in the courtroom, they're <laughs> arguing, right? That's all happening before it comes to Maria's office yes. and the work that she does, right? So uh, the lawyer's arguing in front of a jury, all of this objections, evidence, all of that happens at one stage, at an earlier stage. Mm -hmm. And once in, in, in your case, types of cases, the defendant is found guilty, then the defendant can appeal. And then all of that comes to Maria's death. Yes. Right, and you're working. It's it's very different. It's not in front of a jury. You're no. not really doing that type of argument. Um, you're looking at transcripts. What was said during that first right. sort of hearing? Go ahead and so what was said? What evidence was submitted? Um, if if there were any um, errors, basically you're looking for errors. Mm -hmm. Errors by the judge, by the juries, jurors, um, by the defense attorney, by the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. So whatever errors might have taken place because we want to have, uh, give the defendant the best trial they could have, yeah. you know, um, error free, yeah. uh, uh, within reason. Yeah. So that's what we look for. So it's all research and writing. Research. And then about two years, sometimes four years, sometimes 10 years later, wow. depending on whether it's a capital case, non-capital, then there's an argument, a hearing before um, a bench of three judge justices or or, you know, the Supreme Court. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And what uh, type of person, I'm, I'm just always so intrigued by particularly stuff that I don't do, right? <laughs> <laughs> My area of law, I love and I'm intrigued by it, but when it's something that I don't do, right? And I think people would find very interesting. Um, what type of personality do you think or, or, or um, skills, because it's different personalities that also work in appellate than trial. And it doesn't mean people can't be successful in both, yeah. of course, but what are the type of things that you think, like if, if a student is kind of looking at their life and what they like to do that, they could say, oh, maybe appellate uh, attorney is something that I'd like to do because those are my interests. So I didn't start out to be an appellate yeah. attorney, so I was a civil litigator. Um, we, I handled personal injury cases, mm -hmm. a couple of family law, which I didn't like. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, so I developed the skill sets of a, of a trial attorney. So mm -hmm. I was trained to be a civil litigator. Whatever case came before the former firms I was at, mm -hmm. I was able to handle. So uh, that was my training. And, and my, uh, my husband is my law partner, so his training as well. Mm -hmm. And then we got into very aggressive civil litigation at our last firms here in LA. And uh, when we decided to form our own firm, we continued civil litigation, representing uh, mid-sized companies and, and professionals. And we had one colleague of Steve's that said, you know, you should handle appellate cases, mm -hmm. just get on the panel to keep that skill set. It's a different skill set mm -hmm. than arguing in front of a jury or going betting heads with opposing counsel mm -hmm. in <laughs> depositions and, and uh, discovery matters, you know, preparing the case for trial or settlement. Um, so we did, and they were kind of the bane of our existence because they were <laughs> small cases, yeah. not as profitable, and took up more time. But we did, and I'm 
so glad we did because civil litigation cannot, can be very time consuming. Mm -hmm. You're preparing for trial, it's, yeah, it's all encompassing. Yeah. At least it was for us. And it was great because it was the two of us working together up all night. That It was fine. It was for us and, yeah. and, and you know, made a great team. But then once our child was born, um, babies aren't on your schedule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then you want to be there for them as much as you can. So uh, working around the clock and coming out to Riverside for a TRO, term for a restraining order for your client, is yeah. not compatible with a child. And... Um, we started our own firm to have time to have a family and a well, balanced yeah. life. So when Michael, our son, was about five, Steve said, you know, I think we could make a good living just handling the court-appointed mm -hmm. cases and, mm -hmm. and then get on the, the yeah. multi-panel. And so we did. So our personalities... Um, Steve is very outgoing, as you know, you've met him. And, <laughs> and I love Steve. a lot He's of so high-energy guy. Yeah, so uh, I'm more you know, soft-spoken and, um, but, um, but tenacious. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so between the two, we made an awesome team yeah. in, in the trials and in our respective firms as well. We did, we did great work for, for our other firms. But then we have a high-level practice always, always wanted to do the best work that we could and um, made us have attention to detail Mm -hmm. and uh, and really research the cases that would support our position in the civil litigation yeah. uh, arena. And that transferred well to appeals. You, yeah. you, you want to go through all the documents, and a lot of our cases were document-intensive, uh, breach of licensing agreements. One, one case we had, we had to go to Hong Kong and get a solicitor there oh, wow. to get documents. Um, cool. So one of our law school classmates had a connection with family <laughs> is still in Hong Kong, and, you know, um, this... This gentleman was really hiding assets and just so many oh, wow. layers of companies, uh, reselling the licensing agreement uh, yeah. for clothing a million times over. So our client was one of the people in the line that he kept reselling the license to. So, so we were used to working with a lot of documents, and, and now that everything is on the computer, it's a lot easier than having actual physical boxes of files right. and going through. Um, but actually, when we, when we decided to, to focus, uh, gosh, almost 20 years ago now, on, on the mm -hmm. criminal appeals, um, we still got the boxes of documents. Mm -hmm. And so we would have um, my sisters, my uh, nephew, oh, yes. and my niece yes. come in and <laughs> scan great. the documents for us to make it yeah. easier to, to search and find and, yeah. and save us time. Yeah. So technology has always been our friend in, in our firm. Oh, I love technology. Yes. <laughs> We're living in such a great time, too, because a lot of things are coming out that's making uh, our lives uh, much more efficient, I think, as attorneys as yes. well. Yes, yeah. so we, we, Steve is always cutting edge on the <laughs> technology, so he's been using AI, just testing it to summarize yeah. our transcripts. Mm -hmm. um, still, yeah, it still needs some work, but, yeah, you yeah. Know, but it does help. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. I think it's very important for uh, young people to know that uh, all types of personalities can be very mm -hmm. successful in many different areas of law. Because uh, again, you think about TV and you think of this very you know, boisterous sort of individual and, and you might think, oh, well, that's not really me. I'm more like quiet, reserved. I love to read. I love to write. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a place in the law for you yes. there. I mean, uh, good. And a super successful career. Yes. Um, so a uh, story to that, yeah, back yeah, yeah. when I was in high school, um, I think it was end of junior year, beginning of senior year of high school, guidance counselor, um, we had to meet with, with our guidance counselor to find out what career path yeah. we were thinking at the time. And so I met with, with my guidance counselor and I said, well, I'm thinking of either being a CPA or an attorney. Okay. And when I said attorney, she was taken aback and very well, well-meaning, very yeah. kind person right. said to me, um, well, Attorneys are usually student body presidents. Uh, uh -huh. And I, rem I remember thinking, well, that can't be because there's only one student body president per year. And there are a lot more attorneys <laughs> yeah. than, than that, I know, right? Even with, with all the schools, high schools in, in the country. Yeah. And so I said, well, what about my grades? Mm -hmm. Can I be an attorney based off of my grades? It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. Definitely. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's all I need to know. I didn't need her approval for my career choice. That was my personality. Um, my, one of my younger sisters had a different experience. And yeah. She thought, oh, okay, then I can't do that, I guess. But my personality is like, well, no, I mean, 
it didn't make sense to me that what she said, as well-meaning as she was, and there are all different types of attorneys, yeah. um, as you know. Uh, yeah. Some are soft-spoken, some are mm-hmm. you know brash, and I think um, being meticulous, being a thinker, think before you speak, mm-hmm. <laughs> goes a long ways to being a very successful uh, attorney and to represent your client. Uh, the the ones that go off and put on a show for the client yeah. end up not doing the best for mm. their client, actually. Yeah. It's been my experience. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, that story that you just gave us says so much already about you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to get a, a little dig, dig a little deeper into that. Um, and I've heard you in the past talk about pushing the envelope, right? And the need for uh, us. And I know you've spoken and you speak a lot from the, uh, Latina um, aspect as yes. well, right, in the law um, and how you've had to push the envelope in your career. And I want to talk about that. Uh, going to the beginning of all that, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you you get a lot of it from your mother. Yes. Think, right. <laughs> so maybe can we start there and sure. talk to us a little bit about your mom and kind of what you learned from your mom growing up? I, I understand that you came to the United States at two years old, right? Yes. Same thing for me. I came at two years old. So can you talk to us a little bit about that and then what you learned from mom? Okay. Right. So um, my mom was the eldest of six children in a very tiny fishing hamlet in Mexico uh, near Mazatlan, but not that near. Um, mm-hmm. Very um, hardworking, but um, but just the working poor basically of that time. Yeah. And my mom tells the story that she went without shoes at 15 mm. and was really embarrassed because her, she had a growth yeah. spurt and my grandmother could not afford yeah. to buy her any. Um, so they oh. left uh, their little pueblito, mm-hmm. uh, Chametla is the name <laughs> of it, still there. And my mom says uh, the last time we visited was about 20 years ago and looked the same as when she left. Wow. They did not progress beyond yeah. uh, one stop sign, dirt and cobblestone roads. And... Um, but, you know, good people, but just yeah. didn't have the opportunity to get beyond. Mm. My mom had to stop working, or working, stop her education when she was in fourth grade. Mm. My grandfather was a fisherman, but also had a drinking problem. So my grandmother had to go to work. So my mom had to be the homemaker for her younger siblings oh, and wow. cousins, actually. Um, wow. So at in, yeah, fourth grade, you're what, about 10, yeah, nine, 10. And so that was her life. Um, until they moved, uh, made their way to Tijuana, um, and uh, started working there yeah. as, as a you know, housekeeper, a nanny, everything, just every, right? whatever she could do without a, having that uh, high school diploma mm-hmm. um, or opportunities to even get near it. Um, my dad, similarly, was uh, born in central Mexico in one of the states called Guanajuato, Valle de Santiago. Uh, municipalities, he would call it, municipio. Mm-hmm. And it is, was much bigger. I thought that was small before seeing my mom. So I would go to my, my dad's family yeah. for Christmas, um, make the drive down from, from Redondo Beach mm-hmm. wow. <laughs> in the station wagon, crammed wow. in there, uh, stopping just to rest because we couldn't afford to stop at a, yeah. what, I don't know if there were hotels along the way, but you know, Yeah, couldn't. extra expense. Yeah. Yes. So, um so they, he, my dad was also searching for something better. He was able to make it through sixth grade and before he had to stop and help the family by working. And um, when he was 17, he wanted to, something more for his life. So he went to Mexico City and found out that they, the class system was still there. Who are your parents? You know, where do you come from? And, you know, he just wasn't able to break it there, mm-hmm. make it there. So then he headed north, al norte, you know. So mm-hmm. he ended up in Tijuana where my parents met. And my mom was very resourceful, <laughs> always. Um, loved to read. Yeah. And um, like I said, had a strong sense of justice and wanting to help others. Yeah. Um, my dad, um, hard worker, entrepreneur, mm-hmm. and, and also wanted to help others. So my dad uh, apprenticed as a mechanic there in okay. Tijuana. And... He founded his own uh, pickup parts, uh, Yonke, as it was called. Yeah, yeah. So they took, bought old cars 
and we just break them apart for parts. And somebody needed a spark plug back in that day that couldn't afford to go to the store and buy one. Well, you can hear there's a used spark plug that mm-hmm. works. Mm-hmm. So that's what he did. And he prided himself on always having the pink slip for anything he had. Everything. So on, everything <laughs> on the up and up. And then he had uh, a truck that delivered water to the colonias, the, the areas above, um, out in the outskirts of Tijuana, uh, because running water was not available then to those areas. And people had cisterns where they would yeah. hold water yeah. and, and wow. use it. So my grandmother, actually, my mom's mom, that's how they grew up and, and lived. Mm-hmm. Had to heat up the water to for shower or for baths, not showers or no showers. Um, to wash the dishes and and wow. then it bottled water for drinking and everything else. So um, and an outhouse. My grandmother had an outhouse. Uh-huh. Uh, so I was always terrified I'd fall in as a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was where, you know, where they came from, the environment of just work hard, you know, do the best you can to get ahead, but help others, you know, younger siblings, um, friends, mm-hmm. people at church. Um, that's, that, that's their background. And yeah. My dad was very successful. They bought a house on the outskirts of Tijuana going to Rosarito, actually. And life was good. My mom was happy. Mm-hmm. There were four of us then. And then my dad said, I still can't break through to where I want to be. Mm. It's just, you know, the class system here, even in Tijuana, which was more cosmopolitan yeah. and more of a melting pot as far as people's backgrounds, still getting, couldn't get ahead. So he said, we're going to go to to the U.S. And my mom was like, what? <laughs> you know, her her support system was there in Tijuana. Sure. Her mom my, and younger sisters, they were all single. And my aunts, uh, were very doting, mm. but my aunts, very doting aunts. Mm. Um, what little they had, they would share. My grandmother would make us tortillas, whatever we wanted. Oh. We could have a whole soda to ourselves and not uh. split it. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it was wonderful times. Yeah. So, um we stayed with my grandmother for, my mom told me two months. I, I don't remember the time period, sure. so, but about two months while they came to Redondo Beach where my godmother lived okay. and um, to try to settle sure. before bringing us there. So my, my godmother was a um, housekeeper mm-hmm. for wealthy families, made her way somehow up the, up the coast from San Diego yeah. to Beverly Hills. Yeah. And she was working there. She had three children um, that were with her mother back in Tijuana. And the gardener liked my godmother and <laughs> <laughs> my Nina. And the, the homeowner said, hey, the gardener is interested in you. She's okay. like, no, 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 I'm done with that life. You know, I have okay. my children and yeah, my yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we persisted and he was a wonderful man. Uh, Pedro Parra, Don Pete, we called him. Okay. He was a gardener in Beverly Hills and Palos Verdes area and his little home beach cottage that they owned was still there in Redondo Beach. Um, so that was our little second home once we moved to Redondo sure. in a one bedroom little beach cottage um, that my parents made work. Yeah. We were happy. Oh, that's so wonderful. Um, I, you know, I've, I've heard in the past you mentioned that, uh, you know, you're here and you're growing up and thinking about, you know, the path that sent you down the law, right? And uh, that you observe some injustices that uh, your parents experienced that you, having grown up here, would say, hey, you know, (laughs) like you you guys can do something about this, but maybe they didn't know or didn't quite believe that somebody would be on their side. Um, can you give us maybe whatever you're comfortable sharing, like an example of uh, one or two of those situations and how that uh, you, impacted you at, at an early age as well? Yeah, my parents, um, so when I was in third grade, decided had saved up enough money to buy a house. My dad actually really wanted, was working at that point at a factory mm-hmm. um, and was getting to be a four person for that factory, uh, making artist stretch canvas, what the artist paints on. Wow. Um, there in Redondo, small factory, and um, he was running the business for these three uh, partners, mm-hmm. and he wanted to buy into the partnership, and they just kept giving excuses. Buy a house first, which was great advice, mm-hmm. so we did in ninth grade. We moved from 605 North Irena to 518 North Irena, carrying my toys up the street, you oh, know, because uh, yeah. not even a block away, <laughs> um, and... And then they just kept giving excuses. So by the time I was in sixth grade, 
he said, they're not, told my mom, they're never going to let me buy into the practice. Mm-hmm. I'm practice in the, into the business, so I'm going to start my own. And then my mom's like, "What? Yeah. <laughs> there was a company station Steady wagon, kicking, yeah. a gas car, so all these oh, little perks that yeah. they threw at him." But he saw the money that was coming into the business because he would collect the checks. He dealt with the vendors, he dealt with uh, customers, uh, the supply chain, the employees, mm-hmm. so he could run it. He's mm-hmm. not, you know, I'm just not collecting the money. I'm doing everything else. So they started the business out of our garage. Wow. And uh, eventually... Uh, I love that. I don't know how... And, you know, I'm surprised. Redondo Beach it was pretty noisy, a big crum- air compressor, make stapling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but somehow it worked. Yeah. Um, so my dad would um, go to work during the day, be there at eight, um, but get home from work and pick up whatever orders had to be done. My mom, while we were at school, would get us ready to school. You know, always had a breakfast, always had lunches ready. Mm-hmm. She'd work while we were in school. And then when we got home from school, she'd wrap it up and then, you know, get snacks for us. And sometimes bake cookies yeah. and then yeah. get dinner ready. And, you know, always had clean clothes. <laughs> and they were ironed back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how she did it. Yeah. You know, I really do not know. And, and find time to read and, and you know. We should always have a book with do her. everything. Yeah, yeah, do everything. Superwoman. Yeah, so even upholster furniture because you can buy, you know, when the furniture started wearing out, she learned how to upholster chairs. Wow. You know, yeah. <laughs> buy the, the faux leather mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. fabric to, to do that. Right. Um, she was very crafty, so I yeah. learned how to appreciate crafts because, yeah. of, because of her and my aunts, actually. So, um, so that's how it was, and... When I was 13, I started working in the office once I got an office. Okay. And in my summers and times off from school. And I saw there was one customer in particular, biggest customer my parents had at the time, who um, would take advantage of, mm. of my parents. And so they, he, my dad had a, a the, pro, the procedure was if you paid within 15 days of the invoice, you could take 10% off the bill. Okay. He would pay two months late and still take the 10% off. Mm-hmm. And it just kills me. It's like, Dad, you know yeah. what? You know, there's recourses here. You can take yeah. them to small claims court. And <laughs> I, I knew that much, yeah, right? Because yeah, uh, yeah. the amounts, well, they were a lot to us. But, you know. Um, yeah. And it's like, no, no. That's how the wealthy get wealthy, my dad would say. And it was another immigrant uh, from Japan that was the customer. Mm-hmm. So he would think, hey, you, you've struggled to build your business. You know, sure. you, you help us out a little bit by at least... Don't have to pay it 15 days, but don't take the 10%, you know, mm-hmm. on top of it. Mm-hmm. And my parents didn't believe that the the system here in the United States would protect someone like that. They would even be heard mm-hmm. over somebody with a lot more money than they had. Yeah. You know, that they just, that wasn't their reality in, in Mexico. So they just, you know, kept yeah. that. Yeah. And, and that just made me think, gosh, Someone needs to represent these small business people to yeah. let them know, you know, hey, there is a recourse. You you can be David going up against Goliath, mm-hmm. right? And 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 succeed and win if you know the law's on your side and um, justice can be yeah be done. No, absolutely. It's 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 amazing how those types of situations growing up, like we see. I mean, kids see everything, right? And take note of that and how that can have an impact. And I, I love well, one the story that you shared with us. Thank you so much. Like your your dad, um, you know, not being allowed to be a part of this partnership, this business, buying in, and he goes, okay, well, you know what? That's a challenge. Here's how I'm going to face it. Right? I'm going to do my own yes. thing. Right? <laughs> you don't want to let me in? Then I'll right. do my own. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and I think that's, that is the immigrant spirit, right? There's an yes. entrepreneurial spirit to yes. it as well. It's not just to immigrants, but I think that it's shown there. Um, uh, I think we'll talk a little, we'll talk a little, I'd like to talk a little bit later about how that entrepreneurial spirit also is in you, yeah. right? Because <laughs> you did that as well with your own firm. Um, two things here. Um, I've heard that you at a very, your parents at least have t- said that at an early age, you wanted to be an attorney. Yes. Right? Um, and is that something that was talked about? Can you tell us a little story, but then is that something that you talked about with your parents or your parents talked to you about growing up? Because you said that when you talked to your counselor, that was something that was on your mind. Yes. Um, so by then I was, had already been working in the business uh, mm-hmm. for four years. Um, Unpaid labor, mm-hmm. child labor. Yeah. Well, hey, <laughs> but, don't we all? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and, yeah. and I, I didn't see it as, hey, I'm owed this money. I saw it as, 
this is an investment in my future. Mm -hmm. So this is how long I'm going to get my education paid for. Mm. And my parents always stressed education, the importance, because they did not have the opportunity mm -hmm. at all. And yeah. um, because of their socioeconomic status. So they said they would, we would pass by a college, university, didn't matter where. Mm -hmm. and my parents didn't know from community college, from four-year college, you know, just college. It's like, that's where you're going to go to school. That's where you're going to go to school. Uh -huh. Some old traditional brick type building that, you know, thinking it's a college, that's where you're going to go to school. And they would say that they to would you say as you to drive me. by? Yeah, driving by. Wow. And that whether just... it was in Mexico or, or here, you know, that's where that's you're going so to go That's so cool school. because they're putting it in your heart and your mind, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. Wow, I love that. So, so I always, I don't know if it was, you know, ingrained in me that way, but, mm -hmm. but I always wanted to do more mm -hmm. and, and take advantage of the opportunities. Um, having the, um, a very traditional family, the women are very protected. Mm -hmm. So my mm -hmm. dad kind of freaked out. It's like, oh my God, I all these girls. Oh my gosh, you got to protect them. <laughs> sure. What are going to do? You know, back in their little yeah. towns, they knew everybody. And if somebody uh -huh. was acting out, he, he knew who to yeah. go to and right. his parents and all that. But here, you know, he didn't know. So, so I was always trying to push the envelope, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's a whole world out there, you know, wanting to do. So, um, joining Girl Scouts, <laughs> you know, my, one of my friends in third grade, uh, wanted me to be a brownie and my parents like, well, no, we can't afford to buy the uniform. And so she lent, she gave me one of her uniforms to, and she actually was immigrant from Germany. Her parents, uh, wow. lived, lived up the street, rented a house up the street, uh, uh, Debbie Newmark. I still remember her. <laughs> and so she got me into it. And I, I love the, um, the leadership mm -hmm. and, and the learning. Yeah. So um, we, brownies didn't sell cookies then. But my, my little troop, you know, it was a quarter. That's so cute. Quarter you paid. <laughs> uh, we used a tiny room in, in our, with our church and um, the mom of one of my classmates. And we walked. So yeah. we went to the police station for a field trip. We went to the fire station for a field trip, wherever we could walk, because everybody That's, walked. Nobody, your parents yeah. didn't drive you places. Yeah. They, it was like one car for a family, and everybody, uh, dad was working, so he had the car. Uh, that was the I family just environment. Picture this little troop walking. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so, cute. So yeah. it was empowering, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to to learn more and 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 to go to these places and we saw the jail it's like oh I never want to be there <laughs> you know the, yeah. and it was I'm sure very nice by jail standards and yeah. in Redondo Beach especially back then yeah. um, so then I got into you know, bridged up to a junior Girl Scout and that my parents were like oh now you're really extending mm -hmm. where you're going no 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 we we can't keep track of you if you're going. Mm -hmm to a Lazy J Ranch, you know, Sleepaway Ranch for a week. Right. And so I remember I, very tenacious, and my mom said, that, that guy, which is not a positive word in Spanish, actually, uh, but tenacious like is better stubborn. in Spanish. Yeah, right. stubborn would be the yeah. equivalent. Um, yeah. But I uh, convinced them to let me go. Yeah. The, the leader then, um, both leaders were Catholic, so they were part of our church, so they felt a little more comfortable. Sure. Um, because the leaders went. And so I get back from the bus uh, after a wonderful trip, yeah. took care of a horse, jumped on the trampoline, went on this hike of Malibu um, Hills. Yeah. And I'm really happy. And my dad goes, your mom cried every day. Aww. And I said, well, I had fun. <laughs> 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 yeah. So... Um, so that kind of drive, you know, sure. that I got from both parents, actually, mm -hmm. of wanting more and, yeah. and seeking out the world yeah. was in me. And, 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 and so I think that's my affinity towards helping Latinas more yeah. because I think we have an extra hurdle, um, intentional or not, sure. by that protectiveness that yeah. is in our culture. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, and, and I also love the the way that you're saying it because there is this idea of, of protection, right? And 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 yet sometimes that can be uh, limiting, yes. right? Um, and so the being able to be protective and loving, and uh, at the same time, you know, even them, I guess, unbeknown, uh, unknowingly, or perhaps, but we're in creating in you this idea and this desire for more like hey you're <laughs> gonna go annoying. to school here this is what you're gonna do and you're like okay that's what i'm gonna do yeah, <laughs> right yeah, yeah. and of course as parents wanting to protect you no matter what but yeah you know uh, and I love that, yeah, that is a focus that you have with Latinas in particular, right? To, to yes. help and empower them and to push them along. In fact, that's how we met. Um, yes. And that was because right. you, with, with Cher, my with Sharon, sister, yeah. when she was in law school, and 
um, she was someone that, you know, looked up to you and you spoke to her and encouraged her and were mentoring her and as you do so many other <laughs> folks and young uh, Latinas. Um, and from my end, uh, and this is me telling a story now, but um, from my end, it was like, I just knew of you oh. because <laughs> of all that you did and because you were helping my sister. And I was just a fan of yours because of that. Oh, you know, I just you, love Kenny. everybody <laughs> who's going to like be ni- love and like be nice and to my family. And, um, and then we got a chance to meet and then I was like, wow, she, she really is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, but it's very clear that you also have that, um, you know, it's not just a side mission, but it's like a, also a purpose in your life, right? Yes, that, of helping Latinas. Um, how did we go from, and we might be skipping a lot of mm. things here, but maybe I'll, I'll give this question and then we'll work our way through it. Okay. And I think the ultimate question at the end of the day is, you know, how did that become a passion in your life, right? How did that become something that you so actively do? Uh, mentoring Latinas, mentoring students, helping them, not just with words and time, but financially as well. You have scholarships endowed at uh, Loyola Law School. You do so much work at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Um, And so that's where we want to get, right? (laughs) Um, Starting off with like you going to law school now, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're getting ready to go to law school. I heard a story about you... um, uh, just walking in and doing an LSAT, uh, taking yes. the LSAT without studying for it. You just did studying. it. Um, can you tell us that story? Like I, when I heard that, I was like, that's wild. <laughs> I, you know, there was uh, limited guidance mm-hmm. from the guidance counselors at, at Cal State Dominguez Hills. I, I went to community college for two years, mm-hmm. El Camino Community College. And then I was determined to finish, even though I was started at a community college in four years. It was the most economical way for my family to be able to support me, although they always said, you don't worry about the finances. You know, we'll take care of that. That's our, that's our job. That's our, our concern, not yours. Mm-hmm. You get the best grades you can and that's it. But I was also limited <laughs> by their protection that I had to drive. I could not live on campus mm-hmm. and, or mm-hmm. drive too far either, actually. So um, El Camino Community College um, was a, a good way to start. Tutored it as if I were already at a four year, mm-hmm. took as many classes as I could, learned as much while still working part-time in the family business, doing payroll for 40 employees at the time. Yeah. And it was old school by hand payroll then. Yeah. Um, software was just prohibitive. <laughs> I looked yeah. into it. It was just, it was, it was like thousands. I think it was like 8,000 for the one software company that had a small business um, uh, application. So, um, so, and then the two years at, at Dominguez. And I was going to be, I started as a CPA. Cost accounting did me in when I was a junior and I, my business law <laughs> class, I loved. Yeah. And so then I was always in the back of my mind, should I, the law, the, the seeking justice for others and mm-hmm. helping others. I thought the law was a good way to go. Mm-hmm. So I was talking to a classmate and she, I said, you know, I don't know which way to go now that we're getting close to graduation. And she said, well, which do you think would be harder? I said, well, you know, going to law school because I already have a business degree or I will be getting one. I have the the you know, the theory and the practice, seeing for my parents' business start from day one um, and working there. So I think law school would be harder. She says, well, do that first. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And you can always go that's back. Cool. Okay, that's right. I can always go back, get my that's MBA. Advice, yeah. So I never went back. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I t- went to the guidance counselor. I said, I, I want to apply to go to law school. Hands me an envelope with the application for the LSAT. And that's it. In the material, there was nothing about courses, <laughs> handbooks, nothing. Yeah. Our, our bookstore had nothing. Yeah. And actually, to date, they only have two LSAT prep books in the, in the wow. bookstore. And Steve was the one that noticed, hey, they only have two books here. It's like, what? Wow. Um, more in, of the GRE, lots of GRE yeah. books and, and a couple of NCATs. Hmm. So, um, so I thought, okay, you know, send my material in got my, my information as to where to take the test and uh, when to show up. And there was a little booklet that yeah. came with it. So like the day be- the night before the exam, um, we had a party with all the family. And yeah. I don't remember the birthday or what, but the whole family, <laughs> yeah. all my little cousins. I'm the eldest of all my yeah. cousins as well, not just of my immediate family, but yeah. my, uh, I think they're... Grandmother would say, "Oh, I only have eighteen grandchildren." Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. very sad that she didn't yeah. have too many. Um, but they were all over. My younger boy cousins, especially, were very rambunctious. 
And my mom's side of the family can be very loud. My mom was not loud, but the rest of the family is sure, yeah. boisterous. Uh-huh. And, um, and so I'm looking at this exam, the sample questions, like, oh, my gosh, I am not ready for this. And I start yelling at him, be quiet. I have uh, to take a yeah, test. Yeah. It's very important. And they could care less. Yeah. They were like fourth grade, fifth grade. Yeah. You know? So I start panicking a little bit, but um, get to the, the test. And then I'm in line with everybody else to sign in. And this one guy behind me says, hey, did you take the free LSAT course at, for minority students at UCLA? I didn't know there was anything uh, to prepare you for. So yeah. then I'm really feeling pressure. Yeah, right before. Yeah, these. <laughs> right before. Thank you for telling me that. And I open, <laughs> open my booklet, and then I see the, the logic puzzles. And I think, oh, my gosh, Miss Hensler in fourth grade taught me how to do this. Mm. We did logic puzzles in her. Wow. I just had her for reading. She, amazing teacher. Amazing. Very strict, but amazing. Now, had you think outside the box before that was a thing? Yeah. And... And so I thought, okay, how did Miss Hanser teach me to do this? Mm-hmm. And it came back to me, fortunately. Wow. So I got up in the, you know, the top quarter, barely, in mm-hmm. <laughs> my LSAT, but it was, you know, good enough to get into law wow. school. Um, but no direction, no, yeah. no support, no, no one that I knew. Um, but going back to, you said, what my parents had said, my godparents, um, my godmother was a nurse, amazing woman. She was a midwife. She served in the military in Mexico and uh, just held, had such class and, and, and mm-hmm. dignified way of carrying herself. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, just the fact that she could help people like that, I thought was amazing. You know, she gave injections and all that stuff mm-hmm. to, um, for people that couldn't afford to go to the doctor. She would help them uh, and, and not charge just. You know, you buy the medicine and not if it's an injection, because in Mexico they gave a lot of everything was vitamins and antibiotics, injection, start working right away. Um, but my godfather was an attorney, only because my godmother pushed him to be. He was not necessarily the hardest worker, had a little bit more privileged life. So I think that mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. was why. Um, but I never knew exactly what he did. It was practice in Tijuana, solo. And um, when I went to visit him, I applied to law school. I, had, I don't know if I'd got, I don't think I'd gotten in yet anywhere. And um, they were already separated because um, my godfather had gotten his secretary pregnant, so oh, they no. had separated. Oh, no. mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, and so my godmother went with us and said, "Yeah, she, my dad said he's very proud. She's going to go to law school." And and. But my godmother said, but she's going to be a good attorney, not like you. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what he did. I think he just handled whatever came in the door when he yeah. wanted to work. Uh-huh. And um, he passed away before mm. I started law school. So um, he never got to see that part yeah. of it. But, um, but I always thought I wanted to be a nurse, like my godmother, and sure. help so many people. But my, my mom told me that I announced one day when I was four that I was going to be an attorney. You were going to be an attorney. <laughs> and they had no doubt that I probably would, yeah. would have been because I always politely, respectfully, question Uh, and wanted to know why the whys you know so I remember when I was in second grade um we went to thrifty drugstore which is now Rite Aid and they sold clothes and shoes and we would buy our clothes there primarily tennis shoes and and pants and things and it was near Christmas so they had this beautiful cherry red scooter just old school scooter no nothing motorized and it's like oh my gosh the holy grail for me that's like wow Mm -hmm. and I asked my parents, can I get that for Christmas? And they looked at me appalled. And it's like, my mom said, that's a boy toy. <laughs> and I'm like, look back at it. And I say, well, it's red. And red is a girl color. I told them. <laughs> I said, what's my response back? And Those I did get it for Christmas. Advocacy skills yeah, already. <laughs> I, you know, having that kind of a family, I learned my advocacy skills at a very young age. Yeah. <laughs> All throughout, yeah. kind of pushing that envelope. and. Sure. Just to even go to a football game was yeah. like, you're going to go out at night and, yeah. and chaperoned? <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. was down the street from where we lived, the high school. So just, you know, w- one of the things that I love about your sharing and, and your journey through high school and, and college, applying for law school is that, you know, we mentioned, uh, and this has come up already a couple of times here, of maybe there's a protective environment around you, it might seem a little bit limiting, but that you do the best in your situation, right? And I think that's so important for young people to like hear and to to know is that 
circumstances are never going to be ideal, right? right? And we can always look at somebody else's circumstance and go, hey, like if I had their yeah. parents or their <laughs> life, right, like my life would be different. But I think I look back on my life and, you know, it's certainly chock full of sort of challenges and limitations. But growing up, I don't know, I, I didn't really see those like that. Or if I did, then you'd think about how do I succeed nonetheless, yes. right? Um, how do I still get wh what I want or where I need to get get to? And that those limiting factors, quote unquote, can actually be those things that mold us and yes. create us into the adults that we become and then what we can do for others, right? Yes. Do you agree? What do you think? Yeah, I do. Um, and I think that's um, going back to your question about or helping Latinas. Yeah. I think that's the impetus for, for getting okay. there. I wanted to make the path smoother for anybody that came after me mm -hmm. because of all the challenges I faced, you know, from someone telling me, no, you, should, you, you know, you can't be an, insinuating that I couldn't be an attorney because I wasn't student body president right. to um, a million other stories and, and, you know, being told later, well, back in law school, our dean was not, at the time, was not very supportive of uh, women and minorities. Mm -hmm. He was brought in to raise the, um, the ranking for, for our law school, Loyal Law School. And he was very focused on numbers mm -hmm. and not people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which didn't really mesh with Loyola's looking at the whole person and helping, you know, underserved communities. And they were you know, the first Latina license in California, Mary Villarosco, hmm. Loyola Law School grad, the only woman in her, in her class. Uh, there were six that started with her. She was the only one that graduated. Um, wow. And... Um, I forget who's African American. Also, in, in LA, you know, they they yeah. and they had an I program first. To have an I program to help working people who wanted who wanted to be attorneys. I mean, they've really looked at a diverse group mm -hmm. for generations now, and and welcoming everybody. You know, yeah. uh, well, our dean was not welcoming, yeah. and he made us think that we did not belong. Mm. You know, made one of my classmates who was fifty, which seems very young now, but at the time seemed Older, oh, she was already a grandmother and um, wanted to go back to help children. Oh. And her husband actually invented the lump, was the engineer that invented the lumbar support for cars oh, wow. system for somebody else. But his boss was very uh, kind to say, hey, I'll give you a percentage of, of this wow. as well. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have to work okay. anymore yeah, yeah, they <laughs> you know, okay. at that point. Yeah. Built her dream house in Glendale Hills. And when she, she was asked, hey, mom, what do you, by your daughter, what do you want to do now that you know, money's no option. I want to go to law school. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> so she said that's to help awesome. children yeah. and wonderful woman, yeah. Ada Assembler. And she, and she did, she had that opportunity, but the Dean made her cry thinking, you know, you don't belong here because you're going to lower my rankings because mm -hmm. the stats say you won't succeed. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Jeez. minorities and, and, and just looking at me as, as a Latina, he thought you're going to bring my numbers down. You won't succeed Yeah. to the point that and he was my torts professor, or tor <laughs> so yeah, I saw yeah. him every Jeez. day, first year, um, to the point that when we graduated, uh, graduated from law school, you know, have to go across, walk <laughs> across the stage, shake his hand. He looked at me, was like, "Oh, oh and, no!" And kind of like this, wow. I said, "Yes, I told you I would." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? yeah. So all the way through, uh, people underestimating you, mm -hmm. um, people um, telling you you can't do. They don't know you. Mm -hmm. They don't know your makeup. They don't, you know, perseverance and tenacity trumps intelligence any day of the week. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen it. And um, if you continue on your path, regardless of what they tell you, you know, outside world may tell you, mm -hmm. you can succeed, you can achieve. You may not get into Harvard, but you can get into a CSU or a community college start and get to your goal mm -hmm. just as fast as if you'd gone to Harvard. Yeah. You know, the doors might be closed. You can push them open. If there's a little crack, push it through, <laughs> push, it, push through. it through, push it through. <laughs> yeah. You don't know how to get there, start figuring it out. Make the connection, start networking with other people. There are a lot of good people that will help you. Yeah. You know, that will help you along the way. Thank you, Maria. That's like one of those where we clip that and like that's what we want to put out because like that's so important for people to hear, right? Young people to hear that and to be encouraged and inspired uh, despite their circumstance. Um, one of the things, and I'd like to ask you uh, to speak on this, is uh, just like your experience in uh, taking the LSAT, right? Yeah. 
you didn't know there was a course, you didn't know like what you had to do, is that there is so much lack of information or mm -hmm. institutional knowledge when it, it is a first generation sort of uh, student or a student who doesn't have any family or background in the legal or professional ranks or anything like that. And so um, it's not that students are less smart no. or no, it's just like, yeah. look, if I don't have that information yet, then I don't know what to do. But it, we just have to get that information, right? right? And I think that's a lot of what you do as well is that you're helping people acquire that information to help you bridge those gaps, right? Yes. Um, because they're just, they're not even real true gaps of IQ or intelligence or anything of like that. It's just information. That's all it is. And so um, can you speak a little bit about that and how important it is for students to ask questions? You mentioned seeking uh, uh, you know, networking or professionals mm -hmm. that can help with that and um, how that is important. Cause for me personally growing up, I didn't know anybody and I wasn't asking people for help either. Right. A lot of like, Hey, look, uh, I'm just kind of do it myself, put one foot in front of the other and okay, I have to go to college. Okay. Get information. But I wasn't asking anybody for help. I had no mentors growing up. I didn't have any of that. So now I try to do that for people. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, ask, because like, yes. I really wanted to make the road easier for you. But so can you speak a little bit about that and like how students and what students should do? Yeah, I, I didn't ask either. Yeah. You know, um, going to the guidance counselor was as much of an ask. And, yeah. um, you know, I just, this is what you do, right? Like you said, put one foot in the front of the other and, and, and keep going through. There is more information available now through the internet that was yeah. not uh, for me, um, that, that you can get information about law school. There are pipeline to law programs mm -hmm. That please, please, please take advantage of those programs. Yeah. I just they're free. They are free. You have to apply and you may not get chosen, but there are plenty others. And I tell students, if you have to wait a year and apply again, mm -hmm. go for it. Go for it. It's okay. There is no limit to when you can apply to go to law school. Mm -hmm. you know, it's eight is you know, fifty, you know, <laughs> yeah. that, that example. Yeah. Um, so ask and take advantage. Go to your pre-law um, advisors, pre join a pre-law society, um, ask any professor. Career centers are kind of hit and miss. Um, when I engaged with Dominguez back in 2017, after not being there since I graduated, um, I went to the guidance counselor or the counseling center and I t spoke to someone there about offering, you know, my contacts and connections to, to help students. And uh, they said, oh, our, our students don't want to be attorneys. Oh, it's like, no. wait, yes, they do. I yeah. was one of your students yeah. and I, I'm an attorney. And I said, yeah. I can give you 10 other examples just off the top of my head yeah. of students that went to Dominguez who wow. became attorneys. So, you know, if you get that kind of response, oh, no, no, find a workaround, find another way, yeah. you know. Um, but now if you just do a Google search for pre-law programs, pipeline to law programs, you will find those resources. And then ask, ask, what do I need to do to get in? Seek out a professor to review your application. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know an attorney, seek out a professor. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a law professor. Just any professor will, you know, yeah. a, a beloved professor will help you whatever you decide to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's so important. I didn't do it, but, it's a, but uh, you know, later on I learned to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, af after... Graduating yeah. from law school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and attorneys, I think, are are very willing to speak to young people who reach out to them, right? Yes, and you know, since um, reaching out and mentoring, uh, I connect students. If someone's interested in immigration law, which I didn't have not practiced, I can connect them to another attorney, and they're more than happy. Mm -hmm. Or you know, one or two or five attorneys, you know, that will speak to them, and everybody is more than happy to help. Yeah, you know, the next generation of, yeah. of advocates. And it's kind of easy now as well because, like, I, I've had this either you know, a student will send me an email or find me on LinkedIn or mm -hmm. on Instagram, and we'll just set up a quick, you know, Zoom. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now it's so easier. easy, right? <laughs> so you just set up a Zoom and they get to ask questions and you answer, share stories, and that helps them, right? Uh, so much so. And it's, it's, I think it's exciting for us, like it is for you, to share stuff that you wish you would have known yes. to help them on to their help. journey, right? Yes, to make it easier because, you know, a lot of us don't have a parent who's mm -hmm. an attorney mm -hmm. um, or a sibling or, or, you know, or the wherewithal to say, oh, let me get you a tutor to help you for this prepare for an exam. You know, even when I when I was, took the SAT, the, the conventional wisdom at the time was, 
it just measures intelligence, so there's no way to study for it. Mm. That's what we were told. Mm. So, so Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> and then they said, well, take the military test. It was, it was called the ASVAB at the time. I don't know if they still offer it. So that, as a junior, it's like, well, this is to prepare you for the SAT. And then I got hounded by the military, by the army actually wanting me to, to join because I did so well on it. It's like, I thought, well, if my parents couldn't afford to even get me started in college, then that would have been a route because I would have gotten my education paid for that way. But I'm glad my parents could afford it. (laughs) And um, so I think we have so much background in terms of um, why and your heart for empowering uh, Latinas and empowering students. Um, Can you speak just a little bit more about that, though? Like, why is that? And how did that become ultimately a passion for you? And I I know you have a, an active practice and you, you have death penalty cases <laughs> and you're doing very important work. And yet I also know that we, I see you everywhere helping <laughs> people out and, you know, creating programs here and there on these different boards. And it's not every time I see you on that, it's not a burden. Uh, it's something that you love doing and that you do willingly. Um, and there are so many people that consider you their mentor that uh, think of you as a Im- very important part of their life. Um, how, why do you do that? You know, <laughs> how did that become also a, a, a purpose in your life? So the, the purpose was to make it the road easier because it did have a lot of challenges mm-hmm. to overcome, um, you know, every step of the way to, to get to, to becoming an attorney even. Um, and, you mentioned the scholarship we endowed. Mm-hmm. So my husband and I endowed a scholarship at Loyola Law School. Um, and 25000 at the time endowed the scholarship in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. And um, we had very successful results in a class action case. And we gave back to our church and um, That's awesome. a little bit more amount. Mm-hmm. And then to to endow the scholarship. And I want to, wanted to name it after our firm, mm-hmm. Lacerp and Villa. And Steve's like, nope, it's going to be named after you because... He saw firsthand as my classmate, mm-hmm. as I met him, we were in the same section first year, the extra challenges I had as a Latina because of the social, societal expectations and cultural expectations of my family. I still had expected to be at family events, cousins, mm-hmm. little cousins, mm-hmm. birthday parties, Doing all, of it. <laughs> all of that. And actually last night, Stu and I were kind of reminiscing a little bit and he, he mentioned, you know, he lived five minutes away from campus, uh, first year of law school and rented an apartment. It was lonely, he said, because there was one there. So, Five minutes from leaving campus, he was home studying, mm-hmm. you know, rewriting his notes and all that. I said, five minutes from campus, I'm on the freeway. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm by US, USC on my way on, down the 110 to yeah, get to Redondo day. Beach. <laughs> yeah, on a good day. Um, you know, usually around midnight, actually. Then mm-hmm. once I got kicked out of the library, I would, I would <laughs> leave, yeah. I would leave uh, with a few other classmates. So we had the same experience. Yeah. Then, <laughs> so Judge uh, yeah. Gustavo Stryker was one of those classmates that we got, all got kicked out of the library. And then, but if I got home earlier, you know, maybe in time for dinner, my little sister was, you know, a toddler. She'd put her hands up and I'd pick her up, you know, and, and comfort her or play with her for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then see my other sister, my mom, my dad, any aunts and uncles and mm-hmm. my grandmother, whoever was around, mm-hmm. have dinner, you know, get clothes and stuff ready for the next day and then be able to study. Mm. <laughs> yeah. In, in my room with family noise. And, you know, my hat off to our, our first uh, Latino uh, justices, California Supreme Court, Cruz Reynoso, who could study in a small home's kitchen with 11 siblings <laughs> running yeah. around and, yeah. you know, the pots and pans and all that. <laughs> it's like, I couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, I could not do it. Um, you know, some people can, but I just couldn't tune out that, yeah. that noise. Yeah. So that's why I was in the library until yeah. they kicked me out. Um, but... But anyways, so I just wanted to make it a little easier for the next generation. That's Steve saw that. That's beautiful. And I, I didn't know he, he was watching at that yeah, level, yeah. but he did. And um, and so we endowed that scholarship. And even with the endowment, there was still a fight to make sure that it stayed for Latinas. Um, okay. And yeah. um, because there was a push after Baki to... Mm-hmm. Um, um, the anti-affirmative action um, mm. propositions and case law that came down in California um, to move it away or open up to everybody. Yeah. yeah. And um, it 
which is now part of the um, Immigrant Justice Clinic, mm -hmm. and that way it stays, it, it stays mm -hmm. to help the community I wanted to help. And, yeah. And, the, and, and the Latino focus can, can be in there. Yeah. And so um, that was a concession I made. <laughs> Otherwise, nope. <laughs> the intent is, and yeah. you know, it's, uh, so many having to fight still. Well, so you, many live, people. you live that life, right? Yes. And you know what uh, it is. And it, that doesn't mean, you know, there isn't support for any other uh, demographic. Of oh, course, no, and no. we do that. Happy and to and that's great. Um, but I, 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 I know exactly what you're saying, right? Because for me, it's something similar as well, right? And, and you want to, you've lived a certain life and you know what that is and you want to help uh, right. folks who are in that situation as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's a beautiful thing that you've yeah, done. I didn't have the benefit of somebody, Mr. Harvard, who was in our class that, mm -hmm. you know, went to prep school and his life was, his past was paid for him mm -hmm. for this. And mm -hmm. so in creating, wanting to create a pipeline to law program at Dominguez for Dominguez students, CSU Dominguez Hills, um, I want them to have some type of a pipeline if this is where they want to go. Or just even to explore, to see what, if the law is something they want to do. Yeah. Um, because others, other people get it from their family and connections and contacts. And yeah. uh, most CSU students don't have that. Yeah. And to your point, you know, when you spoke to that um, uh, administrator at, at Cal State Dominguez, <laughs> when you said, hey, like, I'd like to do something, she said, or I don't know who it was, <laughs> said she, yeah. um, that our students don't want to be attorneys. Well, it's like, okay, m even if that were true, <laughs> that nobody had vocalized that, Maybe they don't know they don't perhaps know. that that's yeah. an option, right? And yes. if there's something there that explains it and they can learn, then, you yeah. know, that opens your eyes up to a whole new world and something that actually might be um, something that you want to do. Yes. So uh, I had a, a student, first group that we took to, to Loyola Law School. Shout out to our alma mater for supporting that um, initiative um, of yeah. bringing students in and, and providing the in-kind support of the classrooms and um, mm -hmm. uh, swag, Loyola mm -hmm. swag mm -hmm. and, and paying for some of the food and, and other attorneys who pitched in to, yeah. to support that uh, that day for the students. Um, just lost my turn of thought, no, no, sorry. You know, and and while, while, while you were gaining that, I'll just mention here that, you know, um, Maria has created this pipeline program to the law at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And that's been going on for uh, quite a while. Uh, but this year, um, it has been opened up to all Cal State University students who are interested in the law. And it's a little bit later this, well, we're recording this right now in the beginning of March. And it's going, is there's going to be a day this month where um, it, all Cal State University students can come to Loyola Law School, learn about the admissions process yes. to law, um, kind of sit in a classroom and go through like a mock sort mm -hmm. of lecture, which is wonderful and it's great. So it's this really great thing that started with you walking into Cal State Dominguez Hills yes. and saying, hey, I'd like to start something yes. and now has opened up to uh, all CSU students. Yes. So the only thing I asked is please don't, don't forget Dominguez because yeah. of the CSU, sometimes we get uh, forgotten. Cal State yeah. Dominguez Hills. In, Car yeah. in Carson. So mm -hmm. um, it came out of the uh, the ashes of the, the Watts uprising. Mm -hmm. And uh, Governor Pat Brown then said, hey, the, the Dominguez was scheduled to be opened in Palos Verdes, <laughs> of mm. all places, in an old bank building in Palos Verdes. And he, Governor Brown, Pat Brown, saw, had vision and saw the need to have a university of the community for the community. And Dominguez still is of the community for the community yeah. in, in its mission and its I roots and DNA. Yeah. <laughs> so to, to hear someone say, oh, no, our students don't, well, that made me push more. more <laughs> to, okay, we need, we need this. So still with the provost, uh, we had our meeting on Thursday, a board meeting. I'm the chair of the Philanthropic Foundation Board for Dominguez Hills and said to the provost, hey, Loyola has institutionalized this now. They're, and they're scaling it to all CSUs. What are we going to do here? When are we going to institutionalize this? Because mm -hmm. now I no longer have to be involved. I was invited to, to speak, to do the welcome, welcome in the morning yeah. uh, for, the, for this year's event. But come on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come on. Yeah, yeah. We need to institutionalize it here. Yeah. So that, and, and the other thing is sometimes people think in silos. Oh, I'm a business major, so you know, I don't have, I'm not pre-law, so I can't go to law school. Or mm -hmm. I'm pre-law, I can only go to law school. Uh, you know, 
There are no silos. Uh, My classmates at at Loyola, they they were music majors. Um, Ecology (laughs) was a a new thing. It was a a major. A lot of poli-sci, English, um, some of the uh, behavioral sciences. It was a gamut. Mm -hmm. Uh, Second career people, dentists, nurses, teachers. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just get your bachelor's, and then if you have an interest in seeking justice, Absolutely. Or helping others. Or you are a realtor and you want to, you know, do more, Mm -hmm. you know, find out about these agreements that you're having your clients sign. (laughs) Go to to the law. You're you're, um, in the fashion industry. You better, you want to figure out how to help your your clients and and the vendors, you know, with these contracts that are pages long. Yeah. Go to law school. So Loyola also has those those programs of reporters. Um, to help protect themselves as well. Yeah, <laughs> They're sure, out there cr- sure. covering news. Um, yeah, no, the, do not be limited. Do not be limited. Yeah, you, there's no one road to get yeah. to law school. Absolutely. Yeah. I tell people all the time, my sister is going to be, she majored in psychology. Right? She's going to be a psychologist. My brother majored in neuroscience because he wanted to go to med school, right? And But then they decided to go to law school. So it's not a, a, you don't need one particular major. No. And once you become an attorney, every profession, every industry has a need for an attorney. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not limited. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, well, we're kind of coming to the end of our time here. Um, it's so there's so much to talk about. I can speak for hours, you know that. that. <laughs> no, and you know what? I, and I could sit here talking with you for hours. I love this. That uh, it's funny because we've talked uh, so much that we haven't even gotten really to your career. <laughs> so my career in, path. In, in, in five minutes. No, <laughs> it's um, not, it wasn't linear. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you know, um, you know, I, I know that. You know, getting out of uh, out of law school, you and Steve were, mar- uh, were married and went to Texas, right? Uh, well, actually, uh, out of law school, I worked for legal aid yeah, for a little uh, bit. So mm-hmm. we, I graduated in 86. Steve and I graduated in 86. He had a commitment to the JAG Corps mm-hmm. because he had taken an ROTC scholarship, and that's how his undergrad was paid for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and just a side note, he worked as a waiter for the first two years. At, oh, wow. He was at San Diego State in, in San Diego and uh, commuted, at a triangle commute. And so he just... Couldn't focus in school, so he barely had a 2.0. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, I tell him, I would never have given you the time of day if I'd known you back then because ah. you weren't serious about school, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and then he got the scholarship, he could stop yeah. working, and then he got 4.0 wow. for the rest of his academic yeah. career the next two years. And um, got waitlisted at Loyola uh, and was ready to go to, to Texas, St. Mary's, for law school when Loyola said, hey, we have a spot for you. And uh, we were in this, ended up being in the same section, and um, as much as both of us, uh, so we're here to, to be an attorney, yeah, yeah. no relationships, nothing, yeah, yeah. you know, God had another plan and, yeah. and we just, you know, keep coming back together. Off. So mm-hmm. we started dating. He left. Um, the army could have sent him anywhere, mm-hmm. Germany. And I was hoping for DC. <laughs> he had interned at the Pentagon. But we ended up, he ended up in central Texas, uh, Colleen, Texas, an hour north of Boston. Mm-hmm. And so I, well, he was, had not proposed or so figuring out what to do. Mm-hmm, and um, one of my friends said, well, you should go live with him. I was like, nope, no, I'm not <laughs> going to change my life unless it's, yeah, know, it's for, unless it's for life, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, um, and so I worked uh, at Legal Aid for a year. Gotcha. I really enjoyed helping others that way. But I also like nice things, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the sal- they didn't pay much yeah, yeah, <laughs> back yeah, then. Yeah. And uh, I do remember one of the uh, associates at the time talked to the, the interns and and said, um, or the, so, "So we're just out of uh, post grad um, about the career there." But she was a trust fund baby because I loved her suits, and you know she had was more into fashion then. And mm-hmm. said, no, that's not going to work for me. And then I worked in Amnesty Law. Um, Ran a PI for a firm in Century City before Steve proposed. Yeah. And then he was settled as much as he could be in Central Texas. And then we got married. Got it. Oh, I didn't know that. That's, <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. And and so, you know, throughout your journey, um, I know that you had to experience uh, difficult moments uh, being a Latina as well as at that time as an attorney. Um, and there in Texas, coming back here as well to Los Angeles, working up 
to opening up your firm and even at that point, right? Um, is there perhaps a, a story or, uh, that sticks that you know sticks out during one of those situations where there was that sort of challenge um, and what you did to overcome that? Well, when we got married and I ended up in Central Texas, mm-hmm. um, I had already gone to see it, and it's just like in the middle of nowhere. Um, I had been given uh, some advice from a, a classmate who had gone to Baylor, which is near near in Central Texas near uh, Colleen, and he said it's very provincial. But I just didn't realize how provincial it is. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel the racism, but I definitely felt the sexism mm-hmm. from the military, from the community where I ended up working at uh, there in, in town, at, at the courthouse from the judges, sure. um, from the bar association that mm-hmm. I ended up being a part of. And so when, when I arrived there, I thought, how am I going to fit in here? How am I going to make a difference here? Mm-hmm. And... There were challenges as, as a woman, more than as a Latina, but as a woman, you know, in court, the judges looking you up and down, like well, deferring to my partner, mm-hmm. the male. Um, and then when my co- my other colleague, um, associate, and I tried a case, and you know, two women, a blonde and a brunette, and <laughs> um, just a lot of different challenges along the way, just because we were women uh, thought of as less capable, mm-hmm. uh, paid less. And this yeah. was not just for attorneys, but any other woman, uh, other wives whose husbands were in the JAG Corps, Judge Advocate General Corps, military attorneys, they also felt that discrimination, not being given um, the opportunities that they were given at their former uh, banks and, and, and firms and other states that right. they, where they started out their careers. Um, but, you know, just persevering and saying, I belong here. Um, Partially, my boss was, was more cosmopolitan and, <laughs> you know, loved having us out there um, in the community. It was his, we were of the community. We need to be in the community. And just by being present mm. and being different than everybody else made a difference. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, okay, maybe they are intelligent or maybe they, they are as capable. Yeah. And so my word of advice to all the students I speak to yeah. Get comfortable being out of your comfort zone. Beautiful. Be comfortable being the only one who looks like you in the room. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's really hard, and you, you have to sometimes muster strength. Mm-hmm. There was uh, when I, uh, my first meeting for the uh, State Bar Board of Governors, which I could tell you a lot of stories of all the challenges along the way to break through in L.A. to even get on the ballot, because <laughs> it was a, a countywide election. Um, I see all these white males lined up in front of the door where I have to go through for the ballroom for the meeting. And in my briefcase, I had just had Michael. So I was, you know, two weeks past, uh, after he was born. Um, so all that discrimination because no new mom, should you even be running? Mm. You're going to take a, a seat. Yeah. Of the old that. school, the old guard belief in LA. Mm-hmm. The big firm was controlled by the big firm partners. And so I'm like, took a deep breath. Um, my head high and walk through. And they weren't the Board of Governors. They were the administration for the state bar mm-hmm. even. Yeah, right. But but they were, you know, one guy was um, the first openly gay uh, man on, on, in the cabinet of the state bar, uh, administrative cabinet. He uh, was he welcomed, but everybody else was kind of looking at me like, mm-hmm. you really don't belong here, but right. I guess you're here. Yeah. We don't know what to do with you. <laughs> I love that you saying that because half the battle is just showing up. Yes. Right. It's yeah. just showing up and being uncom- being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I love that you said that. And, and that's really what it is. It's, hey, like, just show up. Right. Yeah. Be there. Um, yes. Put one foot in front of the other. But there's so many people there that want to help and that will help, uh, particularly nowadays. I think. Yes. It's, yeah, it's, even it's more so now. Much, so. But the best advice I got once being a new Board of Governors member, um, where there was an annual dinner with the Supreme Court, California Supreme Court. And I remember uh, walking with a another um, board member who was supportive. And Mm -hmm. so the elevator opens and I see the court, you know, the the justice is just there in in this ballroom, huge ballroom, but room, one part of the room for this dinner. And I kind of start to start breathing heavy. And it's like, am I hyperventilating? I've never done that in my life. (laughs) And I thought, I don't have a bag. (laughs) Do I I have to put a by my purse? Breathe in my purse? What do I do? You know, just Mm kind of all this going through my mind. And then uh, Jim Otto, the board of governors, like, it's a little heady the first time you have dinner with the court. And he just (sighs) took that off, that pressure off me. And it's like, 
yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to go through. And in that meeting, um, Supreme, then Supreme Court Justice Joyce Kennard, uh, who was, um, overcame so much adversity in her life, polio survivor, um, half Asian, half Dutch, raised in, um, in, in the northern part of Europe where there was no one else that looked like her or her mom, and just overcoming so much adversity to yeah, come to this country uh, every step of the way and to, to get to the court, she said, show them that you can be the best you can be. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's like, very gracious woman. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful role model. But I thought, wow, you know, just mm -hmm. wow, a Supreme Court Justice is talking to me, but yeah. also giving me heartfelt advice. Yeah. And I already knew her story and her experience. Um, and just uh, someone I looked up to. Yeah. To oh, tell me that, my, my hero. Right? That's beautiful. It'd be like RBG telling me something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. You know, it's, it's funny because, uh, I mean, nerves are just a part of everything. Uh, yes, yes. And, you know, just people think, oh, wow, you, you know, it's been so strong. Well, yeah, but strength just means you can overcome your fear, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you're still exactly. nervous, but it's on the inside mm -hmm. as much as possible. And, and it's just the one time. And then I was comfortable being on that board, you know, mm -hmm. and comfortable having dinner with Supreme mm -hmm. Court justices and addressing the Supreme Court justices. Um, even though one put down Loyola in front of me, it's like, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. who's, well, my daughter went to Stanford, you know, law. It's like, well, I expect nothing less from the daughter of a Supreme Court justice, <laughs> you know, daughter yeah. of an a, a apprentice mechanic, another story, right? right? Those opportunities aren't available to us. Um, but just to tie back to, to my experience in Central Texas, when we were ready to leave, Steve decided not to stay in the army, thank goodness. <laughs> um, did not like that, you know, time and grade system. Mm -hmm. and, and, and wasn't really merit, because he worked so hard. Yeah. Um, he has a lot of stories there of overcoming <laughs> adversity too. And, and I thought, um, I got a call and to, my, to my, my office and somebody, said, uh, this is Maria Villa. Yes, it is. And it's like, well, you know, we've heard of you and seen what you've done in the community. We'd like you to run for city attorney. Uh -huh. And I'm like, wow. And, you know, <laughs> I made a difference. Happen? I got, yeah. you know, how could, how could I make a difference was my thought, you know, three and a half years earlier. And, and I did. And I said, well, thank you, but I'm going back home to California mm -hmm. and, you yeah. know, to my family. And, and then I told my boss and he wasn't happy because the firm was the city attorney for Colleen. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> didn't want to lose that, that business. But, you know, sometimes you don't know the impact you make, as you mentioned, the mm -hmm. people that I mentored. I didn't seek out to make an impact. I just, I just wanted to help. Yeah. Well, Maria, um, you have helped and then yeah. some. <laughs> I think you've done much more than that. Um, and, you know, personally, on a, on a personal note, and on behalf of my family, thank you for always being so kind and, and, and generous and gracious with us. Um, we really do appreciate you. Um, Thank you. And I think uh, I don't throw the word uh, love around very uh, often, but uh, <laughs> we very much love everything that you've, uh, you are and what you've done for us. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and we? I think uh, that we speak on behalf of many people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I don't want to keep you too long here. As we said, we can keep talking <laughs> forever. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us, sharing with us, and for inspiring our um, you know listeners, inspiring everybody who's who's here and is listening and and wants to improve and and perhaps is looking at challenges in life and saying how do I you know make my way through this. Um, but uh, I think hearing your story, hearing your words, and um, being inspired is going to help them. So thank you for You're taking welcome. the trek out thank here <laughs> and, and doing that. Um, and so uh, to our viewers and listeners, uh, thank you so much for listening to The Art of Purpose. Um, we will see you on uh, the next episode. Until then, have a good one.